peace and old standing. Class, how are we doing? Uh, I want to continue with moving forward with disseminating information as it relates to chapter 18. We had, I, I thought we had a, a, a pretty good pretty good class today for the classes that, that, that did meet. We were discussing chapter 18, chapter 17 video is forthcoming. Just a reminder that your assignments are due Friday. Your assignments are due on Friday, which is the 8th. I enjoy reading original thought and I want you to grasp these concepts. So let me get right into it. We have been continuing with chapter 18, European power and expansion. And this is a continuation of chapter 16, which was the acceleration of global contact. And we talked about that. I feel like we learned a lot and I want you guys to begin still to kind of try to grasp what we're doing. So I'm gonna quickly do a overview of 18 and kind of touch the remaining parts that we have. And this chapter has been dealing with the struggle for stability. And I gave you the date of 1589 to 1715. And I want you to let that resonate in your mind. We talked about, again, I want you to always try to develop that that time chronologue. I want you to try to develop develop that time chronologue and be, be able to be cognizant of tying events with the time period, the names, and understanding what occurred. That's the beauty and the objective of all of this. So we're talking about stability for struggle. So what does that include? I talked about and explained how Europe was the low man on the totem pole in the acceleration of global contact. We know the story that you perhaps remember from elementary school when the European thought that the world was flat. Okay, so that was the time of the European acceleration and global contact. We're talking about European expansion and power, and I gave you some scenarios from the text that explain how the European went from being a low man on the totem pole to be, to developing power and expansion and trying to create systems of self-government. So we talked about the dark ages. We talked about the middle ages. We talked about the Renaissance period and within the Renaissance period, we talked about the Protestant Reformation. We talked about the Catholic Re Reformation. We talked about in the next chapter, going with the chronologue, acceleration of European, acceleration of global contact. We talked about the Afro-Eurasia trade market, where these individuals came in together from different countries, cultures, and religion, and began to trade. We talked a little bit about it, economies and what that looked like as far as supply and demand for goods and services that perhaps were not in the area where you lived. So we, we, we talked about that. I'm putting it together for you. So we've been discussing absolute monarchies and a constitutional state, absolutism, the monarchies. We know what that is. We know what a constitutional state is. But for intents and purposes, I would just mention it briefly. A constitutional state is someone that is ruled by the rule of law, or that, that have a, a standard written document that is law, and it, <clears throat> it, it's the rule of law, the law of the land. A absolute monarch, we know what that is. Absolute monarch has absolute, total loot and complete power. Unregulated power. We talked about the divine right of kings. We talked about the great chain of being and these kings were asserting that they were chosen by God and that no earthly power was able to regulate them and that God chooses kings. 
Okay, we talked about that whole scenario, so let that resonate. So, moving toward the end of the chapter, as what I kind of what I talked about today, we were talking about the English Civil War, the three phases of the English Civil War. These, I'm just going to give you some bullet points that you need to be cognizant of for your quiz. Just touch them points for you to go through the text and look at. The English Civil War, the three parts of that, part one, part two, and part three. Part three is known as the Anglo-Scottish Wars. We talked about what happened with that. We discussed how the, common, the English Commonwealth was created with the overtaking of King Charles I and his execution by the parliaments. The parliaments were at war with the royalists. The royalists were the ones who supported the king. The parliaments were the one that wanted to move toward a constitutional state. They were discussing moving away from it. This absolute power thing, guys. So Oliver Cromwell overran King Charles. The people revolted and moved on to, for a brief period, a military dictatorship by Oliver Cromwell. He was called the Lord Protectorate. Okay. So the parliaments defeated the royalists. King Charles was executed. King Charles I, he was put into exile. Uh, he was killed. King Charles II, his son and heir to the throne, was put into exile. So for five years, Cromwell ran this military dictatorship as the English, as the Lord Protectorate, and they created the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is a voluntary, voluntary, uh, a voluntary unison of independent states, countries that come together on one accord. They developed this, Oliver Cromwell did, and uh, it was short-lived. It lasted for five years. We talked about the time period when Cromwell died uh, within this war. Cromwell died in 1658. Subsequently, his son took over. For two years, he was in power. The English people became fed up with him. We talked about it. And they wanted to go back to the monarch. And, and as I said in class today, I'm sure King Charles was very, the second was very reluctant to come back to the English people after his father had been executed but he did come back and he came back under the uh with the collaboration of what was called the british army what was called the british army that ushered in two years after charles i mean uh cromwell's son was uh taken out of power by the Restoration Act of 1660. That restored King Charles II to the throne. However, it brought about a constitutional monarchy. So we were looking at that. What is that? You have to be aware of what these terms mean and the combinations of them. A, constitution, a constitutional monarch, you still have the king as a figurehead However, he does not have absolute unbridled, unchecked power. As we said, the divine right of kings stated the belief that God chooses kings and that their power is unbridled and unchecked and unanswerable to any human authority. That type of power is totally intoxicating. We've, we, we, we've discussed that. So this constitutional monarchy brought about a king. Think about the time and what was occurring. Brought about a king with the rule of law. So after the constitutional monarchy came into place, uh, by the way, also 
you have King Charles I who was executed, King Charles II who came in in 1660. Under the Restoration Act of 1660, King Charles was succeeded by his brother, King James II. King James II. If I'm not mistaken, according to the text, I talked about the Bill of Rights of 1660, which is very important. We have a Bill of Rights here in America. And this is the origin. The verbiage is similar. The Bill of Rights allowed some liberties or rights to citizens or subjects, but it also was the end or the destruction of the absolute monarch. The Bill of Rights gave stated, according to the text, that the king uh, could not revoke any law that had been passed by the parliament. They, they were beginning to create a check and balance. People were tired of absolute monarchy and rulership and people start to demand independent rights because we talked about mercantilism and this whole system in Europe, how the king owns everything. There was no private ownership of property. I talked about the Glorious Revolution. That's something you're definitely going to need to know. The Glorious Revolution is a revolution in term, in terminology. However, there was no bloodshed. There was no warfare. There was no conflict. We know that the revolutions are bloody. War is bloody. But it uses that terminology, the Glorious Revolution, however, what simply occurred with that in 1688, that there was a peaceful transition of power. That's what the Glorious Revolution means, and that's what I want you to understand about it. It wasn't actually a fight. It was a symbolic gesture that mean that there was a peaceful transition of power. Normally, when power switched hands, it was some kind of turmoil or conflict. That's why what, 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 what ushered in the English Civil War, King Charles I refused to capitulate or give in or surrender, if you will, to the new wave or demands of the people to move away from the monarchy because he's remained steadfast to the fact that God had chosen him and that it was God's will that the kings ruled. That's important. One of the main things I want you to really get out of this is the writings. At the same time, there was abundant of philosophies that were going around that were challenging and bringing in, bringing in paradigm shifts. John Locke, one of the preeminent authors and scholars, wrote the second treaty of government. And John Locke described... What is the role of government? What do we want government to do? And he asserted, or uh, it was his contention, that the role of government is to protect the natural rights and interests of its citizens, and that government should be limited. People still today here in America are arguing or trying to come to a I mean, we have an established government, but what, what is the role of government? Government's too big, government's too small. We want government to be hands off. We want government to do give more programs. That's what's going on in America. But the birthing of this whole democratic process, as I said, constitutionalism is the, uh, the type of state that has a, the, the, the rule of law, a document. Republicanism is where the people have a representative type of government that the citizens elect an official to represent their wishes. In a pure democracy, we would all converge on Washington and have opportunity to, to say our feelings. But there are too many people in the United States for that. At the inception, perhaps that may have been feasible or worked, but in today's time, 
based on the writings of John Locke, the representative government, people elect officials that are supposed to have their interests and speak on their behalf and say what the people of a particular area, state, county, parish want. John Locke talked about this. John Locke also said that it is the right of the people to rebel against tyranny if the government is not meeting their needs. Let's stop there real quick because this idea flooded the boundaries of Europe and the spirit of revolution was born. We know, we know a civil war is internal and most of these wars were internal but the revolutions began to occur because people, the kings were refusing to give up their power. So revolts happened. Revolts happened to overthrow the government to change the culture. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, all these are examples of a paradigm shift with the change of power. Okay, so that's very important. I really want you to get into that and look at that more about John Locke and especially the, 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 the section when John Locke talks about the social contract. The social contract briefly is the agreement that the citizens will obey the rule of law and the government will protect their interests. That's the social contract. That's the basic premise of the social contract. That's people enter into social contract with citizenship. You don't literally sign a contract, but it is expected that you obey the law and that the government will protect your interests, your rights, your civil liberties in America. But the origin of that is here. We talked about mercantilism. I explained the uh, differences between mercantilism Capitalism, how that works. I mentioned Adam Smith, his book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, 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 people having the right to strive for their own personal interests, how an economy should work, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at John Locke, you look at Adam Smith and synthesize all that information together, you can see how America's burgeoning society was born from these ideas. There's scholars that say that John Locke is one of the single most important ideas of Pete, single most philosopher, single most important philosopher whose philosophy traveled through time and gave birth to the American Revolution. That's very important. I want to mention to you briefly about skipping, moving forward. There are several companies, if you will, that were created in Europe that participated in the slave trade. They were like investment groups or merchants that were used. I want to list two or three of them for you real quick, just off the top of my head. The East, uh, East Indian Company the Royal African Company, uh, the Dutch West Indian Company. These were companies that allowed people to invest in the slave trade, the enslavement of Africans, and profiting off their sale. Okay, these were companies that did that, and I mentioned those three, and I want you to be aware of that. Uh, I'm going to continue with a part two of this video. So stay tuned. Peace. I'll be right back with you.